Okay, welcome to the Sound of Eagle with Wes Widener. He's an engineering manager at CrowdStrike, and um, he'll be going over the Sound of Eagle and various aspects of audio security. I just want to take time to thank our sponsors here at B Sides from the Kennesaw State Department of Information Systems. I'd like to thank the NSA and Core Security of Help Systems. So, without further ado, Mr. Wes Widener. Thank you. Anything, yeah. So, terrible, and that was like <laughs> unwarranted. So, the sound of evil, talking about audio security. But before we begin, I just want to take like a, a quick poll. Like, what attracted you to come to this talk? We had several others that were going on, several others that were really good. So, what do you think of when you think of audio security? Anyway, yes. IoT. IoT? Surveillance. Surveillance? Yeah. Surveillance? Yeah. Privacy issues. Privacy. Privacy. Advertising. Advertising. Yes. All right. So, basically, I made it up. There's no such thing as audio security. But there should be. Now, the reason why there should be is because audio assistants are coming in in all kinds of places. Right? They show up everywhere. And I would argue that this is something that's really just in its like very beginning phases, they're not going away. Um, if you go back in, like, in computing history, the ability to just talk to your computer is something that's like baked in. Like all the way through our, our sci-fi, how did people interact with like Kid Fox, you know, the, uh, the car, the night rider? Like, we talked to it. How did we interact with uh, data off of Star Trek? talk to them. Like this is baked in. And then all the way through to like, uh, there's a really old ad for Apple where they start off, the, I forget the name of the system, but the whole ad is talking to the Macintosh and having it do things. Now the ad was, was not completely far-fetched. They had a little bit of things that you could do with it. Uh, even the old Newton device from Apple many years ago, you could at least tell it to set a date. So the ability to interact audibly with a computer is like really old promise. And why did it all of a sudden, like, so only recently have all these other uh, pieces come together for it to become like something that we can really do today. So in with that, as a, a good security researcher, we should think about like, what are the ways that this, um, this device can be misused and abused? and also the privacy issues, everything else. So, most people when they think of audio security or audio devices, voice assistants, think about the physical special purpose voice assistant device. The uh, Amazon Echoes, the Google Dots, and then not really special purpose, but the Siri uh, speaker, or the, actually the, Am or the Apple speaker, which had Siri baked into it. Um, but then there's a whole bunch of others, too. So, what is there really to study? So, if we're looking at the devices, the devices themselves are generally pretty simplistic. The, um, they're really just, they really just constitute, like, microphones, some thin processing, and then a speaker of some sort. That's it. And then, IoT side of it, they're actually the best case of IoT. They have end-to-end -end encryption, the firmware is locked down. There was one version of the um, Amazon uh, Echo that had the very first version you could, you could tag onto the board and then get root access. That's how we know that they're, they're based off of an Android operating system. And they have APKs that are installed. You don't install the APKs, Amazon does. But, other than that, the device is really locked down and there's not a whole lot else going on there. Um, so what else is there that we can talk about? I want to introduce the idea of voice assistance as being disembodied. Think about Star Trek, where you're walking along the bridge and you talk to a computer, do this thing, right? That is a voice assistant. Um, and they're, they're not just limited to physical devices. The device is really just a uh, pick or a port for you to say, you know, here's the device or here's the capabilities. 
But the capabilities are built into a whole bunch of other things like cars, phones, remotes. All over the place they're showing up. Public areas are starting to have like a voice assistant type approach to it. So um, they're even showing up in like uh, chat op systems. For those of you who aren't aware, chat ops are like taking a chat type system like Slack and being able to interact with your corporate um, JPENs or some other servers and then adding a voice overlay to it to just tell the device, go build this service or something like that. In other words, they're used more and more as uh, shortcuts for helping us do things that we want to do. There's all kinds of apps that are built onto the phone where you can like create your own uh, voice like triggers to do things. Siri used to be known as HAP. Interesting uh, side <laughs> note there. Until the marketing team thankfully came along and said, don't really want to sell a product named HAL to people and have them put it on their phones and stuff like that. But the idea that like, I think it's kind of amusing that Siri was, <laughs> was initially known as HAL. There's a lot of people here who probably don't know who HAL is. Yeah. Is anybody familiar with HAL? You might not familiar, sorry, I should have done a name. Not familiar with how. 2001 Space Odyssey, wasn't it Space No, no. Yes, yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Space Odyssey, okay. Cooper. Yes, Cooper. I highly recommend that because that is one of the original, like, Sound of Evil. It's where the, uh, the meme of, I'm sorry, Dave, I can't do that, comes from. Yeah, he ends up locking the guy out in space and tries to kill him. Right. Yeah, which is why he's saying that the how's was not a good idea to name your right. voice. So, one thing that we can say, like generalize over voice assistance, is that the platonic idea, and we're talking about like ideal forms for a uh, voice assistant, is really a combination of three different machine learning models. And I know machine learning might give you some heartburn, um, it's used in all kinds of incorrect context or whatever, but this is really the reason why um, why voice assistants are popular now, and they weren't popular when they were first conceived, back in like even the 50s, Bell's, uh, Bell Systems had something called the Audrey um, system that was trying to detect uh, numbers. That was all it was really designed to do, but it was a sort of a primitive voice to speak, or voice to text. Um, other bit of trivia there, the, uh, the person who created um, Tetris was, he used to work for the KGB before he came to the US, and he said one of his projects there was to be able to speak to the MiG fighter plane and like the pilot would, would be able to tell it to do things because it, at high G maneuvers it's hard to move your arms but the sound of, of you know, sound waves travel at like what, 700 miles an hour or something like that. So you could tell the plane to do something and it would do it. I don't know that they ever got that implemented but just the notion that this was something that was way back and that was in the 60s. So today we have all, all the processing power to make this come together. And what we're really at is in the nascent phases of having a, a usable voice assistant. It's not, there's still some huge gaps, but it's still at least useful to where my kids can ask it, you know, to look up facts and stuff like that. So anyway, three different machine learning systems. Voice to text, the natural language processing part of it, and then the text to speech. Each one has its own threat model. And I only want to talk about the first two because the feedback that I got from the different times I've presented this is that trying to, to like cover three different machine learning models in one talk is way too much. So, just the first two. <coughs> to begin with, we have to pick apart the acoustic landscape. If you think about it, and we've actually experienced here in this classroom, like in the, uh, since this talk has started, the, the fact that there are multiple different sound events and sound like occurrences in this landscape going on at the same time. We actually have two different hallways with their own acoustic space that, that's bleeding in because the doors are slightly cracked. Um, because otherwise, if you lock them, then you know, get locked out. But then each one of you guys is your own source of sound. And I'm sitting next to my kids in church, they're definitely a source of sound. You know? And then, like, like, so there's there's all this stuff going on in the audible space. Hello. Hi. So the first thing we have to do 
is pick apart that space, that audio space, and zero in on the sound events that we're interested in and throw the rest of it away. That sounds very simplistic for me to just say it, but to actually do it in processing is really hard. For instance, um, if it, does any of you have um, like the, the bows or the headphones that have the mics built into them that try to like zero in on your voice? So the way that that works, it, it picks apart the space and then it tries to zero in on your voice. One of the most hostile um, places that you can use the headphones at is in an airport. So I was talking to a colleague of mine once, and when he was talking, it zeroed in on his voice. When he stopped talking, it ranges and finds the announcer's voice, the person standing next to him, mostly the announcer. So the point is, lots of stuff going on. It's really hard to process. So the um, voice in the, in the whole sound landscape occupies a fairly narrow band. Uh, the male voice, 100 to 900 hertz, Female voice is like an octave higher or so, 350 to 3 kilohertz. Uh, the human ear has a really wide range. Oh, a bit of trivia while I was researching this. For the male voice, it's typically around 100 hertz. Um, James Earl White, he had uh, 50 hertz as his natural uh, voice range. Yeah, the lower your range of voice, that's the radio voice. Yeah. Um, the human ear, 125 to 12 kilohertz. So, quiz time. Who cares the most about the range of voice frequencies and all that? What industry? What uh, device manufacturers? Any Three guesses? Calls. Speakers. Call centers. Call centers, speakers, or somebody else. Hearing aids, phones. Hearing aids, it, it definitely hearing aids. And phones. In fact, phone manufacturers, cell phone manufacturers in particular, have some of the best uh, white papers on this. They try to, to really narrow in on voice. Does anybody know why? Any guesses? Safe bandwidth. Safe bandwidth, exactly. Yes. Now, you're tempted, as someone who's operating like in this space, to cut out everything above 3 kilohertz because the, the average female voice can't, you know, it goes up to three kilohertz. Maybe you'll cap it out at four kilohertz or something like that. But the nature of sound waves is that it presses up against the higher frequencies. So it's, if you don't include the higher frequencies, then um, you lose things like consonants and it's harder to understand people. So we need to capture, like, generally the entire range of human hearing. Maybe a little bit higher too which comes into play a little bit later. Our brains are wired though, because the audio landscape is something that we naturally like, process and we've been doing it for forever. We fill in, we have these little uh, tricks. We fill in spaces of frequency range that we don't actually hear. Um, oh, and the last part of that is pulling apart sound events is inherently lost. That means that when, we're, when we have the acoustic space, how many of y'all have seen a waterfall diagram of sound? Or anything like that? Okay, that's, it takes the entire spectrum, plots it on a graph. Actually, even plotting it on the graph is losing information by itself. But the point is, the more you hunt for a signal, the more that signal degrades. So, going back to the, uh, the trick of the brain, uh, this is the Alexa dog work commercial, which was one of the first commercials where Alexa was not actually triggered because there was like this whole rash of, you know, Alexa commercials or news reports triggering Alexas. It was this uh, funny case of um, a news story about a, a kid that was able to buy things on their parents' Alexa, and the story actually contained Alexa buy this. And then the news report actually triggered like all the people listening to it, Alexis. So there's this like infinite loop um, of Alexis buying things and, and people reporting about it. So Apple came up with a solution. They would let commercials and news reports know if you cut out this range in the frequencies, people will still hear the word Alexa, but the device will not pick up on it because the model is not trained for it. Okay. It's an easy way to just bypass the trigger. There's an, there's an interesting security implication here too. 
that you could be tricked into hearing something that the device is not processing because our ears um, are tuned to filling in this information. <coughs> in other words, it, it would be a way to have a covert channel. So the way that you pick apart um, signals in an audio space is basically a what's called a fast Fourier transformation. So you take the time domain, so the lumpy signal over here, and you want to pick apart all the different signals up here that make up this signal over here. So if you combine all these signals, they come to this. If you pick them apart, it gives you this. Okay? That is the heart of audio processing. It's actually the heart of uh, video processing or image processing or just about any other signal processing. Okay? Um, but especially for audio processing. So we've got the frequency graph here that most people are used to looking at. But what we're looking for is specific audio events. Yep. That's the first question. Yes. So is that like so microphone is just gonna give you changes in voltage when it's best vibrating? And so yeah. that's gonna give you that picture on the time that you have shown yeah. in the time domain. And then you're saying that the fast Fourier transform is is gonna pick out the individual frequencies that have to be oscillated yeah. in that combined Yes. Okay. So to, to go back, it's good, I probably need to go back over that again. So a microphone is capturing samples of the audio space and it's capturing like across the frequency domain that the microphone is tuned to. Not all microphones pick up the, the same range. But whatever range it's, of frequencies it's tuned to, it will pick up a snapshot in time of what it hears across those frequencies. And it picks up like that lumpy, like it's basically just a frame of data that has, this is the, uh, intensity of the signal at each one of these frequencies at that time. And so a microphone digital signal processing is something like, uh, I guess a, a good average would be like 16,000 samples per second. Okay? And so what we're doing is we're taking that raw audio, 16,000 samples a second, and we're trying to, to take out of those like several seconds or probably even milliseconds, we want to pick out what signal we hear in that. So that's another piece of audio processing, is we're taking the audio space, we're taking a sample of the sound, like every second, every, um, usually every 200 milliseconds or so, we're taking a snapshot, and then we're running a fast Fourier transformation on it, and then seeing what, what signals are in the space at this time. Does that make sense? Did I lose anybody? Okay. If I lost you, I have cards, message me later. <laughs> but that is basically the processing part of just figuring out what signals are in the space at that time. So what we're doing is we're looking for sound events. Specifically, we're looking for human voice sound events if we're, if we're making a, uh, an audio assistant. However, not all, so Alexa has this interesting guard mode that you can enable. And the reason why you don't have it enabled all the time is because it is a, like, some sound events sound very similar. Um, like uh, glass breaking or dropping a glass on the floor or something like that. So, <clears throat> Alex, so detecting sound events, this is like the very basic. Um, car alarm is one like continual sound. Glass breaking is a very similar sound, or a very uh, def uh, definite sound. In fact, here's a, a collection of different sounds and what their plots look like on what's called the male spectrogram. A spectrogram is what I was talking about earlier. You take the sample of sound and you run the Fourier transformation over it and you're picking out. Here's, what, here's the, the signals that I'm detecting in the space at this given time. So if you zoom in on this, it looks like there's a lot of uh, ribbons down and that's because they're, it's a, like a chunked collection of that sound space at that time. If you look at it, you can either fool yourself into seeing it or just take my word for it or like reason into it that these um, the graph of, of the sound there fits what it's describing especially the, the hydraulic hammer you can see the rhythmic and the fact that it, it occupies all frequencies and then it comes off and then it occupies all frequencies and it comes off uh, wind milling machine um, and the, the sound of a generator 
You can see that the generator is more intense than the milling machine, and that the wind noise just generally flooding all channels. The one that's the most interesting here, or the two that are most interesting, are music and talking. Talking is very um, unspecified. In other words, unless you're singing a note in a song at a constant rate, it's not going to fill the audio spectrum. So what that means is there's only a very short amount of time that your voice is making a, a, an impact on the sound waves in an acoustical space. Right? So the sampling of that in time and all that matters. Music. Um, any, of you, any of you guys use uh, Shazam or anything to like uh, determine what song is playing at a, at a certain moment? Does anybody have a Pixel by any chance? A Pixel phone? Okay. The Pixel phone actually has this built into it. You can download like a chunk of, of it's actually 500 megs of audio fingerprints. And it's not for every song in the world, it's for the top 10,000 songs. And so what these fingerprints are doing is they're taking the audio space here for this music and they're, they're determining if you have this frequency and then 200 milliseconds later you have this frequency and then it's a constellation. That is, that is effectively fingerprinting a song. And it takes about 350 milliseconds of audio data to figure out what song is playing. Not a whole lot. And that comes into play later. So uh, another thing before I keep on going is that the Alexa Guard doesn't work on every device. It doesn't work on every device because the more triggers you add to the device, the more it has to actually do classification, which is machine learning operation. And the more processing power it has to have. So the um, Amazon Echoes can't do this. Uh, I also have in there gunshots because one interesting feature or interesting aspect of like audio um, detection or whatever is to um, you can triangulate where where uh, something comes from or where where a sound is coming from. <coughs> so voice to text is all about what's called phonemes. Phonemes are pieces of speech. Okay, does anybody remember learning how to read phonetically? Like these two letters make this phonetic sound, like ooh or ooh, e or a or whatever else. These are the things that we hear. And so phonetics was a, a style of teaching that was about taking what we hear and transcribing it back to the written language. Okay? Same thing needs to be done here for um, voice to text. So what we hear in the audio space are these um, these constant or these uh, vowels and consonants, these these um, combinations. And one interesting thing about this is that phonemes change over time. They change by region. Did anybody have uh, uh, Grand Central Station before it was Google Voice? Yeah. Did you actually have Grand Central Station? Awesome. It was like the first person I've ever run into that had Grand Central Station. <laughs> Basically, uh, Google started this project, or no, Grand Central Station started the project, and it was like you can replace your voicemail with this uh, really cool new technology that will just capture it and store it. And what they were doing was they were trying to build up their voice to text across a broad number of people in different regions. And it turns out that your, um, like how you say words impacts how machine learning models are made to a really great degree. So Google started their, um, basically started their Google Dot project or their voice assistant project like over a decade ago because that's why they bought Grand Central Station is to help build up this stuff. <coughs> I had a particularly southern friend of mine that would always call and leave voice, voicemails and it would always have some hilarious stuff wrong. Did anybody uh, have Dragon, naturally speaking, like the app? Yeah? You remember how long you had to, had to uh, read to it before, it, um, before the model was correct? You had to read to it for like an hour or more before the model would get built. And, but the thing was, it was built to your voice. No one else's. It was a model trained to you. The, the trick with modern voice assistants is that they're trained across a lot of voices, not all, but a lot. Yeah. I remember taking a class on uh, 
the history of the English language and learning about the differences in regional accents, not just in the United States, but internationally. And a lot of it has to do with the height on your uh, palate, yep. where you make the sound, where it's an I or an E sound. If you, it, they would start out more or less the same place because those groups diverge. It was really just about the vowel sounds mm -hmm. and how and the length of the consonants that really determined uh, how strong an accent was and made and made them different. But the problem I see when you're if you're trying to recognize a word if you're a machine mm -hmm. is consistently, you know, a sound would be like a long A or a short A or an I or instead of an E. But Within that, within that region, mm -hmm. but in another region, there may be a word that is the same word yes. that has a, the opposite sound or has a, a, a right. So they, they pronounce it totally different in different regions. So does anybody have a guess how that's handled by the uh, the model? I can see how it'd be handled if, you, if the if, if the computer knew you or knew where you right. were from. But if it doesn't know that, right then you would have to say a lot of words before it would guess, okay, they're uh, everywhere I, where I expect this right. sound, they're substituting this sound, therefore that must be one of these regional accents. So one of the features of the uh, Grand Central Station, later Google Voice, was that when you saw your what it, what it spit out for the, the transcription of your voicemail, you could go back in and edit it. And what that gave them was basically reinforcement learning. So they can, and it was free, free labor, reinforcement learning across <laughs> thousands and thousands of people. And what they also got was regional information based on the metadata of the call, right? So those two pieces together were able to say, somebody calling me from New York, <coughs> for instance, um, there's a certain set of models that probably apply to that person. And so what you do is you layer the different models when somebody's speaking. You layer the different models and say, first you need to do like regional detection, you're right. And then you need to do like, um, and, and there's certain markers, like my Canadian friends and the Aboots and stuff like that. Like that's a dead giveaway. But not all of them have that, so you, you, know, you have to keep on going. So there's actually, you're right, it, it's a little bit deceptive to say that Voice to text is the is like an entire machine learning system. It's actually a collection of them. One of them is where you're from, um, and based off of how you say certain words, and then applying the right model to the voice construct. What I wanted to bring up here with the phonemes is models that are trained off of U.S. speakers, and I guess getting down into it, even regional speakers, they aren't transferable. There's not a generalized model to say, and now we know uh, Korean or Chinese or whatever else has to be a whole different model, whole different set of trainings. What that means is, um, well, this is the collection part of it. It goes back to the privacy. Um, Amazon and Google, I don't want you to get the impression, I, I, will, I will talk a lot about Amazon, but it, it also applies to Google. Um, so this, this case came out late last year. Does anybody remember this? Um, Amazon, like all of a sudden, this, this guy. So what happened was he asked them, I want to know what you're collecting about me. Can you send me my data? Now, out of this, put on our uh, uh, investigator's hat here, there are certain things that we can conclude out of this. One, it is broadly possible to tie someone back to their Alexa device. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to give him any of his own recordings. Second, Amazon has no interest in, in like separating your audio from everybody else's audio. It's basically put into one giant uh, S3 bucket, okay? I don't work for Amazon, but I'm just guessing at the architecture based off of this event. So effectively, an engineer in Amazon just like, here's basically your audio's in this range, in this bucket, and here you go, okay? <coughs> this was not, a security breach necessarily because it was one guy who was asked a question he filled out the ticket incorrectly it should not alar alarm us that um, that the engineer made a mistake what it should inform us of though is that the data is stored and continually like models are continually run over that data to figure out different properties 
So yes, it is recording, it is storing it. I don't know how long the retention of the storage is. No idea. I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't very, very long because you need a lot of data to build these models up correctly. Um, and also there was a related case, I don't have a picture of this one too, the news article, but Amazon employees recently like uh, in their internal chat talking about like different things that they've heard from customers. Well, if they have access to the, like, the buckets of all the information, then of course they have access to the individual information too. And apparently it's enough to where you can actually hear yourself, okay? Um, related to those two articles, I'll throw out another article of, there are two active court cases that are pending in the discovery phase. They're, they're sub subpoenaed Amazon. Give us the recordings of this Alexa that we reasonably believe has been triggered and has data about some crime that happened. As far as I know, Amazon's still fighting. But yes, it is at, it, it's recording. Amazon employees have access to it. To the degree that you trust Amazon employees is the degree that you are comfortable with having one in your house, car, whatever. Now, another thing on this before I go into the waterfalling. The device is always listening, but it's not always streaming what's happening in the room at that time. Notice I said the, the court case, they had a reasonable belief that the device had been triggered. The device doesn't start recording and, and like chunking that information until it's been triggered, until the wake word has been set. Going back to the uh, sound events, so the, uh, the guard duty, that's pushing down a lot more triggers basically to the device. If you hear this instance, then it's a trigger. So those, those events become triggers. The trigger for almost every device now is the wake word. OK Google, Hey Siri, um, Alexa, all that. Those are the triggers. The reason is because the device can't be doing that much um, processing. It's a small device. It's a, I mean, the heart of it is not that, that smart of a device. But when it is triggered, then that's when it starts and it doesn't capture the entire audio space. There's actually some really cool um, research articles from uh, the Alexa team. The Alexa, Sci uh, Alexa Science is the uh, division of the site. And one of them is anchoring the wake word to the person that's speaking. Does anybody have an Alexa in their house? I usually ask this in the very beginning. Anybody? Mm -hmm. I have lots of Alexas. And I give this, this talk. So <laughs> <laughs> also because I, I love the promise of audio security. But it basically, in our house, when we, um, when we go to play music, one of my kids will say, um, uh, they'll, they'll trigger the device, Alexa, and they're still thinking about what they want it to do or, or like play, and another kid will just swoop right in. Play this, play another song, okay? The point is, well, we'll get to it a little bit more in a second, but the device doesn't know who's speaking. It has no concept. We'll flesh that out a little bit more in a second, but now all it's listening for is the wake word, and then it sends the rest of it, or it tries to pick out, pick out who's speaking, or is a king, take that, send the, uh, the fast Fourier transformations, which, act, which is actually a very small amount of data, but it's still enough data that you can reconstruct voice up to Amazon systems. So, um, how can we protect the device from listening to us all the time? So, I propose that we should think about, so there's the network concept of a firewall that protects the ports from coming in. I propose for audio security, we have a concept of a waterfall. Waterfalls flood out sound behind us, and they actually make your device work uh, better, too. Um, noise helps us isolate sounds. If you have a, a headset, noise-canceling headset, um, I did this recently, I installed an AC unit uh, right behind me, and so it's like flooding the space behind me. And after listening to all of this and all the research, my wife was like, I bet it's going to make your headset better too on conference calls. She was right, because it floods out all the noises past that, like the street and kids and everything else. Um, <clears throat> another note here, silence and noise, as far as uh, uh, digital processing, is roughly the same. Uh, what we experience as silence is really a lowered intensity of the audio space. So all those combined, we can do something like put a parasite onto a uh, digital assistant device. 
And what that looks like is this funny little hat here. Um, 3D printed, what it's got inside of it is a, a Raspberry Pi A. This is part of the um, Project Alias. If you guys are interested in that, it's all the plans for it, the software, everything's open source. What it does is you teach it um, your own wake word. So you can rename your device, and it's listening for your wake word while flooding the device under it with sound. And then, once you trigger it with your wake word, it stops flooding the device under it with sound, plays the wake word for the device, and then you can interact with it um, as normal. Most people aren't going to spend the, the time or whatever to build this, so I'm not advocating this as like a generalized solution. Mostly it was a fun hobby and an excuse that I gave my wife to spend like a lot of time tinkering and stuff. So, but I bring it up because flooding out devices with audio and sound, like you remember the old spy movies of sitting in the bathtub and running the water and stuff. There's still some, some usefulness to that mentality. So if you're around the device, think about, am I the only one speaking or am I part of a crowd? Is, how easy or hard would it be for that device over there to pick up my voice? Stuff like that. So, um, this brings me back to the speaker identification. The most that a device can do is detect that, that there are multiple people speaking in, an audio, in a space. Uh, what it can also do is perform like very simple calculations on the frequency range of, your, of the voices that are speaking to say, is this voice high and squeaky, like my kid's friends? Probably a child. Okay. Or is it, is it higher or is it lower than 350 hertz? Probably a man's voice. Otherwise, if it's higher than like 900 hertz, maybe a woman's voice, somewhere around in there. And these are probabilistic calculations, right? The amount of human data, the reason I spent so much time on the frequency range is the amount of data that's in a voice is not enough to give you like confidence, cryptographic certainty, not anywhere close between this person's voice and another person's voice. Even if you trained a model using Dragon, even that sort of a model that was trained in your voice, is not enough for somebody to, for, the, for the model to say, this is absolutely this person. Um, basically, the collision, the, the, the degree of collisions there is very probable. So, while researching this, I, um, does anybody remember the, the, so this is from the movie Sneakers, very big movie person in case you haven't noticed. But uh, the movie Sneakers has a scene in it where they're trying to get access to somebody's account and so they're trying to find like recordings of this person's voice saying, hi, my name is Blah, uh, my voice is my passport, verify me, okay? And then the whole like scenes of the movie are them capturing clips and phrases of the person saying pieces of that. The funny thing here is that the technology to clone a person's voice already existed when that movie was made. So it was completely superfluous. Nobody would have done that. But after researching this, I decided who in, the, who in their right minds would implement um, unlocking something with your voice? Well, it turns out a bank would do that. And specifically, my bank would do that. <laughs> and so this is their like, thing about you can access your account on your phone. You just speak to it. Hey, my voice is my passport because we remember, we remember the movie but we don't remember the lesson from the movie. <laughs> and in that same page, is my voice ID secure? Sure, we have a proprietary algorithm, but you can't bend the laws of physics to make the voice have more bits of information in it to make it cryptographically secure. This is a dumb idea. But lest you think that my bank is the only one that did this, there's multiple banks that did this. Multiple banks, including HSBC. The fun thing about HSBC is somebody decided this is a bad idea. They went and they proved, like, here's how we can do it. Not only did they do this, but they did it on live BBC. Like, they brought in the twin, and I love this picture because it kind of captures the whole, like, this was a dumb idea to protect my bank, my bank account, with my voice. I'm not going to go into all the other things, but I will lay out to you. Anytime you see voice being used as an access control, run. It can't be. It's like, I'm not gonna, I don't want to be too strong in this denunciation, but no. Don't oh, Pindrop is a great local company. They're researching the space of how to do it, but it's also in conjunction with other factors. Um, the second thing, I love Pindrop. 
but even they won't claim like we can totally secure account by one factor voice. Yeah. But catch me afterwards. Yes. So how, how do we do it? Like when I'm listening to you, like I've heard you speak before, like I know your voice, and I mean even without seeing you, I could maybe pick up the cues. Yes. But, and I mean I wouldn't assert that that's cryptographic certainty, but like you know when I hear a voice I recognize, like yes, I know it. Yeah, we know the characteristics of the voice. What I'm saying is like it's you broadly you know that it's me and not my wife and not some other uh, other people that you met. You have a a kind of fuzzy match there. But my point is something else can come along and duplicate that voice like it's not. There's a whole other section of this talk about duplicating voice that's, that's where the cryptographic certainty stuff comes in. Okay. Like, you know that, you think you know that it's me, but in the other part of the talk, cloning voices, you don't really know that it's me, right? And so, moving on, there's a lot to go into here and we only have like four minutes left. So, what I found out also recently is that a pixel allows for you to voice unlock your phone. Another bad security design, but at least Google decides. Do what? They removed that on Google. You're, you're blowing it. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> so, never mind. So they have this feature, like you can unlock a phone, at least when you go to turn it on. I'm just going to keep on going with <laughs> So they at least tell you this makes your device a lot less secure. And, yes, mm -hmm. last month, they completely removed the feature because it's completely insecure. It's funny because like these large companies are putting out voice security and then walking it back. All right, NLP, I don't know that we'll be able to do this in three minutes, but we'll try. This is how your Alexa uses NLP to determine like, intent and all this other stuff. Your wake word, your launch, which is an application, invocation, no, wake word, action, application, and variables. That's how it works. So what you're doing is, you're, you're telling this, and then the uh, NLP in your device, Alexa, cheats. It fills in this other information. So um, if you say, Alexa, play Bob, it cheats and says, oh, what you want is this music application and whatever else. Um, to, to quickly go over that, um, companies tightly control the taxonomy. To craft a better user experience, they have these cheats in it. Basically, you don't know what app you're talking to. This is a real security model there. You don't know what app you've triggered. When you, t when you ask Alexa to tell you a, a joke, you don't know which app is actually providing the joke, which matters when you want a joke that's from the broad pool of jokes and you don't want a continual stream of Jimmy Fallon jokes, which is what Alexa started doing a while back. Um, no way to tell. There's, no, there's also no sense of context, no se uh, so no session. Is anybody, can anybody guess what the security application is of that? No session information. Your device is authorized once for your account, and anybody who's able to speak to that device has that authorization level. There's no elevating or lowering um, authorization or any of that stuff. So, uh, some of Alexa's features have allowed you to um, like tie it to broadly if a if the adult is speaking or whatever, what they're trying to do is filter out children, okay? But it's not, it's not super secure. Um, so there's part of the NLP part is the family had their conversation uh, recorded and sent to a contact. That was not a security issue baked into the Alexa. What happened was the NLP picked up on the wake word, then, they, then it matched something that sounded like call, and then it matched something that sounded like a contact, and then the rest of it was just an open channel, okay? But it was that the model was very, very, like it, try, it was trying to be super helpful and pick up on these keywords from a very far distance called the far field problem. And so, not, so we were talking about like regional dialects or whatever. That's one issue. Another issue is how that sounds across the span of a room up to like 30 feet away. So, um, Google's, um, or, or no, Amazon's response to this was to limit the field that it would listen to. So the effect of that is now I have to yell at the Alexa in my car, <laughs> rather than being able to just talk to it and it deals with all the de uh, data. So, to sum up, and there's, there's tons to say about 
all of these pieces. An uh, hour is really not enough to do it justice, so if you want to catch me later, feel free. I've got business cards, everything else, if you want to tweet, whatever, later. Um, three areas I want you to consider. Voice identity and authorization is not something that uh, audio assistants uh, do, or I would argue can do by the physics of how much voice, or how much data can be presented in voice. Uh, the apps that are on the Alexa can't, aren't, they don't have a way to identify themselves to you, so you don't know what app is responding to you. It's high, it's very easy, there's research papers on injecting malicious apps into the skill store, although Amazon is very, they, they say they're very diligent about policing that. Uh, conveying sensitive information, we never even got to that part, but um, it's, it's across a medium that we are uh, designed to like hear and process. And then the last one, privilege separation, when it comes to uh, basically you have one session token for the device, and it is a forever session token. So with that, um, thank you guys for coming. I've been asking questions uh, all along, but is there any other questions that we didn't get to real quick? I don't want to be too unkind to the next speaker. Yes. Okay. So for authentication, I, I've seen a, another company do this where they would, they would give you a string of numbers and say repeat these numbers instead of saying like a phrase that you could kind of piece out and record. Mm -hmm. Is that a better security solution or say, you know, read this phrase? Would that help? No. Um, basically, any, any audio that you use, if it's a single source of audio, then it can be spoofed, it can be like... But to have a program that would say, okay, I'm gonna, it would have to have all at my... You mean like a capture of a voice? Yeah, like you couldn't replay it because it's random, right? They're gonna say, repeat these random numbers. Yeah. And if you don't, you, you'd have to piece it in together and then play it, right? Uh, not really, because the second half of this talk was all about voice cloning, and so nutshell there is I can clone your voice in like 10 minutes or so of sample data and then I could play whatever I wanted from that. Oh, so you could just re you could make it up. Right. I could. Okay. Yes. Of all the things you listed that need to happen, I feel like the session token thing is more of an achievable future. Is there yes. anything happening in any of these spaces where they're trying to make that happen? I, yes. I don't know the research. They, they are. That's one area of okay. intense research. Yes. You say you can clone someone's voice. Could you would that create a convincing sound clip to make it sound like someone said something that they did not? Yes, absolutely. Deep are, are absolutely yeah. possible. Yeah. Yes. All right. <clears throat> Thank you guys, and uh, hope you have a great rest of your day.